Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, when I was at school, which is an awful lot, long time ago, more years than I care to remember, I was always given a piece of advice which I always ignored, and it wouldn't surprise me if you'd ignored it too. Always read the exam question before you start to answer it. Yeah, you've ignored it too, I can see that. Well, I'm going to look at the exam question tonight. The motion before this House is not whether assisted dying is compassionate, whether it's autonomous, whether it's desirable, whether it's moral, whether it's cruel. The motion before us tonight is whether assisted dying should be legalised, or to be more precise, whether doctors should be licensed to supply lethal drugs to some of their patients in the knowledge and with the intention that those drugs could be used for the patients to commit suicide. Now, I have just described to you physician-assisted suicide. I've heard from the proposition tonight various definitions of assisted dying. I am going to assume and take at face value the propaganda which is being put out by the campaigning groups that their ambitions are limited to physician-assisted suicide, and that is what I'm going to address tonight. <coughs> a change in the law like that would represent a major change to the criminal law of this country. Before I could be convinced to go down that road, I would need to be satisfied on two counts. First, that the law that we have at the moment isn't working. And second, if that's the case, and only if that's the case, that what will be put in its place will be safer. Now, I have to say to you, Mr. President, that on neither count is there, in my view, any convincing evidence. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to explain why. In a responsible society, we don't license an act by law simply because we can empathise with it in certain extreme circumstances. None of us would wish to see a parent who broke the speed limit when rushing a desperately sick child to hospital prosecuted for dangerous driving. None of us would wish to see a mother who stole money in order to buy food for a starving family prosecuted for theft. But nobody would seriously suggest that we should have that we should have laws which licensed theft and dangerous driving in certain prescribed circumstances and, to use the phrase, subject to safeguards. We would expect those laws, the laws on theft and dangerous driving, to be maintained to protect all of us. And for exceptional cases, such as the ones I've described, to be dealt with exceptionally. And so it is with assisted dying. The law is very clear that we do not involve ourselves in contributing to the deaths of other people. It is unacceptable behaviour. The law, on the other hand, also gives the Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP, the discretion to assess every case on the evidence of what has actually <coughs> happened and to decide, in the light of all the evidence, whether there is a case for prosecution in order to protect the public. That is what the phrase in the public interest means. I'm sorry, time is short. Now, what's the result of this law? How does it work in practice? Assisted suicide is a very rare offence in Britain. Less than 20 cases in, in a year cross the desk of the Director of Public Prosecutions. And almost none of them, very few of them, are prosecuted. Now, according to the campaigners, that's a sign the law isn't working. It's almost as though they want to see people prosecuted. Actually, it's a sign that the law is working as it should. The purpose of the criminal law isn't to haul us through the courts and put us behind bars. The purpose of the criminal law is to deter unacceptable social behaviour. And the, the law on assisted dying succeeds in doing just that. The law has the teeth to deter or, or to make anyone minded to assist a suicide think very carefully indeed about his or her motivation before doing so. But it also has the discretion and the flexibility to treat exceptional cases in an exceptional manner and not to prosecute. So, why not just license it in advance? Because that, that is what's being proposed at the moment. Well, let's look at that <coughs> model of assisted dying, the US state of Oregon, where there has been a physician-assisted suicide law for the last 15 years. Let's just see what's happening there. Oregon has seen a rise in the incidence of physician-assisted suicide of 450% since 1998, and the trend shows no sign at all of levelling off. Oregon is a very small place. <coughs> its population is less than half of that of Greater London. If you take the death rate in 2011 from Oregon, 
And if you apply it to the number of deaths registered in Britain in 2011, you would be looking at over 1,200 cases of physician-assisted suicide here if we were to follow Oregon's model. And that wouldn't be the end of it. The, the, the latest ideas that are being floated are for terminal illness to be defined not as in Oregon, six months or less, but would you believe it, 12 months or less. So you can take that figure of 1,200 and double it. And Oregon, Oregon's experience... I, I'm sorry, sir, I, the time is short. How many deaths in this country? Half a million every year. Yes. So 1,200 is what? Oh, yes, I agree. Zero percent, one percent? In proportionate terms, I agree, but it, I, I do not think it is widely appreciated just how many we, we, we have here. Oregon's experience is fairly typical. If you look at Belgium, which legalised voluntary euthanasia in 2002, the, the increase since 2003 in the rate of euthanasia has been 500%. In the Netherlands, which legalised euthanasia and, and assisted suicide in 2001, one in every 35 deaths today is the result of euthanasia. If you are happy to accept these sorts of trends, go ahead and legalise assisted dying. But please do it with your eyes open. Don't make the mistake of assuming that when you legalise something, you simply reproduce the status quo in legal form. There is a natural tendency to look at a very small number of highly determined cases that attract media attention and to say, yes, well, of course, if you change the law, it will simply allow these to proceed without legal objection. He doesn't. Changing the law changes the dynamic. It sets a process in motion. Now, of course, we're told, don't worry, there will be safeguards. And yes, there will be safeguards. And if you don't look too closely, they may look reassuring. But they suffer from two fundamental weaknesses. The first one is that they place doctors at the centre of the assessment process. They, they, they paint a picture of the family doctor, the person who has known the applicant for many years, who knows the applicant's family and circumstances well. It just isn't the case. In Oregon, the official reports show that for those who have died by physician-assisted suicide since 1998, the mean length, the median length of the doctor-patient relationship was just 12 weeks. And that 12 weeks is on a scale of zero to 35 years. Many of these people are receiving drugs from doctors who hardly know them. The second questionable assumption is the assumption of a perfect world. The proposals assume doctors who know their patients well, they assume that people who seek assisted dying are quite clear in their minds either that they do or that they do not want <coughs> assisted dying. They assume that all families are loving. We've heard the term loved ones repeatedly tonight. We've heard the term loved ones. The real world just isn't like that. People who are dying are very often ambivalent about dying. They're vulnerable. They're worried about what the future might bring, about the effect on their families. Many doctors do not know their patients beyond the consulting room. Most families are loving and caring, but I have to tell you, some are not. We have criminal laws, not because most of us behave decently, but because some people don't. When I was your age, the debate was not about assisted dying, it was about the death penalty. Parliament decided to abolish the death penalty in the teeth of some public opposition, I should say. Parliament decided to abolish the death penalty, amongst other things, for the main reason that occasionally mistakes were made and the wrong person lost their life. Yet the risk of error here is immeasurably greater. When I hear of a horrific murder, I sometimes find myself wondering, did we do the right thing to abolish the death penalty? And then my reason kicks in. I say, yes, we did. It, it wasn't and it wouldn't be safe. In the same way, when I see a harrowing case like that of Tony Nicholson, I, I sometimes find myself thinking, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should legalise this. And then again, my reason returns. No, it just isn't and wasn't safe. I want to finish where I started with the law, and I want to quote from you the words of Baroness Elizabeth Butler Sloss, formerly president of the Family Division of the High Court. She wrote this in the Times in January this year. Laws are like nation states, she wrote. Their boundaries are more secure when they rest on natural frontiers. The law we have on assisted dying rests on just such a natural frontier. It rests on the principle that we do not involve ourselves in bringing about the deaths of other people. The moment you start making exceptions to that principle, like introducing arbitrary criteria like terminal illness, you weaken the frontier, you make it more permeable, you make it easier to cross and harder to defend. 
This is not about compassion, it's not about morality, it is about public safety. We need to think with our heads as well as feel with our hearts. I fully understand why people may want to see this, and I, in, in certain exceptional circumstances, I can understand why. But this is not something we should legalise. This is not something for which we sh should set up a licensing system. I ask you to vote against the motion.